Sup y'all, and welcome to Economic Development and Globalization, Part 1. The economic and social geography of the contemporary world is a patchwork of almost inconceivable contrasts. On the simple fields of remote Africa and South America, farmers use basic methods and rudimentary tools. On the Great Plains of North America, Ukraine, and Eastern Australia, farmers use expensive, modern machines to plow the land, seed the grain, and harvest the wheat. Many civilizations in the periphery transport their goods in much the same way as it has been done for hundreds of years, whereas core regions utilize trucks and modern transportation to monumentally improve production. Almost half of the world's population resides in small villages and towns, mainly involved in primary activities. By contrast, more than half live in cities and suburbs, mainly involved in manufacturing and the service sector. Between these extremes, the range and variety of productive activities are virtually endless. Let's just cut the crap and get down to brass tacks here. So, in this video, we're going to be investigating economic development and globalization, starting off with defining and measuring development by asking this essential question. How can we best determine social and economic development? To understand development, we have to first understand how to measure development. So let's look at a couple ways in which we do this. First off, GDP, or gross domestic product, is the total value of all goods and services produced by a country in a year. Here's a choropleth map which shows you the contrast between the poorest countries and the richest in terms of gross domestic product. Now, GNP, or gross national product, is the total value of all goods and services produced by its citizens in a year, regardless of location. It includes things produced both inside and outside the country's territory. And GNI, or gross national income, is similar to GNP, except that in measuring the gross national product, you do not deduct the indirect business taxes or sales taxes. All in all, it is a more accurate way of measuring a country's wealth in the context of a global economy. Now, all of these statistics have their shortcomings. For example, they do not include information on the informal economy. The formal economy is the legal economy that governments tax and monitor, whereas the informal economy includes all things like the black market, the drug trade, or any kind of work under the table. Also, they do not reflect negative spin-offs. For example, in March of 1989, the Exxon Valdez, an oil tanker, ran aground on Prince William Sound in Alaska, basically due to the captain being drunk. It spilled approximately over 500,000 barrels of oil into the pristine environment. Now, according to GNI, for example, the billions of dollars that was spent on the cleanup and all the people you had to hire to do this was a positive, whereas we could all agree that the money would have been better spent if it was used on education or infrastructure or things like that. And if we use these measures to determine the income per person, they do not tend to show the distribution of wealth very well. For example, the United Arab Emirates in 2012 had a gross national income per person of over $24,000. Now that's a level higher than that of many European countries. But that number gives us no hint of the degree of overall participation in the country's economy. For example, Abu Dhabi the emirate that dominates the petroleum industry generated over half of the country's GDP. Dubai, the next largest emirate, generated about a quarter of the GDP. And the Kuwait Wayne emirate generated less than 1% of the country's GDP. Additionally, due to some of the oil billionaires, the $24,000 per person really is not the true average. But in reality, it will be less. So these numbers will show you the mean, but not the mode. And what about different currencies? After all, the value of a dollar is different than a yen, or a British pound is different than a euro. So we use something called purchasing power parity. It's a technique used to determine the relative value of currencies, estimating the amount of adjustment needed on the exchange rate between two countries, so the exchange would be on par with each currency's purchasing power. It's a bit controversial because of the difficulties of finding comparable baskets of goods to compare purchasing power across countries. What I mean by basket of goods are things that people would normally buy, a loaf of bread, a gallon of gasoline, etc. Now a fun and informal way of measuring the purchasing power parity between two countries is by using the relative price of Big Macs. According to The Economist, 
This seeks to make exchange rate theory a bit more digestible. So to see this visually, let's say you had $50. With that amount of money in the United States, you could buy 11 Big Macs if you wanted to. Of course, I don't highly recommend it. But for the same amount of money, you could buy 30 Big Macs in India. Of course, it is a little bit skewed because they are chicken burgers due to the Hindu tradition of sacred cows. But you can see the purchasing power is stronger in Hong Kong per dollar or in China or Russia. However, it is less in places like Canada or Brazil or Norway. Purchasing power parity can give you a good idea of the relative cost of living from country to country. And information from the International Monetary Fund, we can see GDP with purchasing power parity. And the United States ranks number one, and China number two, India number three, Japan number four, and so on and so on. And to understand the relative wealth of individuals, we take a look at per capita, or which means per head, per person. So in this map, you can see GDP with purchasing power parity per capita. Certainly from region to region, you see a disparity between the haves in the United States or in Europe or Japan compared to those in the middle in places like Russia and Eastern Europe or in South America to the least affluent and most desperate in places like Sub-Saharan Africa or war-torn Afghanistan. So far, the measures have only focused on economic development. But what about other areas? This is what the HDI or Human Development Index does. It factors in three different dimensions of health, wealth, and education. So it measures health through life expectancy, wealth through GNI per capita with purchasing power parity in US dollars, and an education index with the mean years of schooling and expected years of schooling. What happens is that these three measures are put into a formula which comes out to the highest number possible as being a one and the lowest possible being a zero. Now, no country has ever reached a perfect one. But Norway and other Scandinavian countries are usually towards the top. You can see more recently, the United States has been closer to around number 10. And you can look at countries in the medium range of human development or countries ranking towards the bottom. But if we zoom in closer, we can always see that within countries, there are definitely disparities. Such as in Brazil, in the southeast area, you see a higher level of human development. And along the interior, you see lower levels and even lower still. There is also the IEF or Index of Economic Freedom. This ranking was created by the Heritage Foundation and the Wall Street Journal back in 1995 to measure the degree of economic freedom in the world's nations. The creators of the index took an approach similar to that of Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations, that the basic institutions that protect the liberty of individuals to pursue their own economic interests result in greater prosperity for the larger society. So you can see that Hong Kong, which is part of China, is considered to be the most free economy in the world. And the measure generally follows the difference between the core countries and those in the semi-periphery, and finally those in the periphery. Again, in this index, a 100 would be a perfect score, and a 0 would be the worst. And you can see in the chart a vast difference between the more capitalist free economies to the more communist and less free economies. And by this index, North Korea is just about as low as you can go. And there's really many other measures still. For example, the dependency ratio, which is an age-population ratio of those typically not in the labor force, or the dependent part, and those typically in the labor force, or the productive part. It's used to measure the pressure on the productive population. So the greater the dependency ratio, the worse it is for the economy. Another measure is the occupational structure of a country. So what percentage are primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary, or quinary will tell you how developed the country is. We can also measure a country's relative technology. The per capita access to affordable transport technology, as in rail or road, and communications, as in the access to the internet, are good measures of the region's relative development. This graph shows the number of internet users per 100 along with the GDP per capita. And you can see a high correlation between internet access and wealth. This graph also displays the digital divide, which is the gap in access to telecommunications between the MDCs and lesser affluent countries. It's really a double-edged sword. Richer countries have better infrastructure, which gives the people better access to technology, which in turn enables them to remain wealthy and educated. And there are scores of rates, such as literacy rates, infant mortality rates, or caloric intake, or percentage living on $2 or less a day. 
The numbers go on and on. If you look, this map showing literacy rates pairs very closely with our other measures of development. 